the Ghost of Pirate Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 147. Fans of snooker will register 147. That's the maximum possible break of snooker. Okay, I, I, I don't know what that... I know it's... I've heard of snooker, snooker as you said. Uh, what does that mean, break? A, a break is like, you know, when you go, you pot a ball, you get to go oh. again, you pot another Yeah, like in pool, the most like regular points. when it, Yeah. Like like pool, yes. Except snooker is a a more refined sport, if you will. Right. Okay. And the most points you can score in a single break at snooker is 147. Oh. Okay. Did not know that. And now I do. Um. So basically, with with snooker, there are 15 red balls, and then there's six coloured balls. And the the pattern of playing snooker is you pot a red ball, and when you pot a red ball, you then get to pot one of the coloured balls. Okay. okay. Yeah. The yeah. most the valuable one is the black ball. It's worth seven. So then you pot the black ball. It comes back on the table. The red is gone, but the black comes back onto the table. Okay. Yeah. So the maximum possible break is all 15 reds, all 15 blacks, and then all the colors at the end. And that comes to 147 wow. points. That's quite it, the run. It, it has been done. It's been done many times in uh, professional snooker. And uh, yeah. very exciting. But... Pedants, in fact, I'll do this in eight uh, in eight episodes' time. Pedants will tell you that the maximum theoretical break in snooker is 154 because... No, did I get that wrong? Of course I got it wrong. My math is terrible. It's 155. <laughs> because uh, you can be awarded a free ball, which allows you to pot any ball as if it's a red. So you can pot a fake red, and it comes back on, and then you can pot the black off that one and get eight, eight extra points at the beginning. No one has ever done this. Oh, this is, wow. This is Fascinating. Now, yeah. now you're getting deep. We should rename this the Ghosts of Snooker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so well, as I was saying, episode 147 of our chapter-by-chapter chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 3 of A Storm of Swords, that's Aria 1, which is so short we can digress about snooker. I was just (laughs) thinking that same thing. We don't have to keep quite an eye on the time with this one. Uh, As always, we're going to chat about the chapter and snooker, and try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment while we do it. My my best ever break at snooker was 28. I I got a red... And then a pink, and then a red, then a pink, then a red, then a pink, then a red, then a pink. Wow. Sound, that's impressive to me. It was, I mean, I, I'm impressed. I played a lot of snooker, and that was the best I ever did. So I'm not troubling the professional game, but I was very proud <laughs> of that. Um, we'll summarize that, what happened, discuss our thoughts, and it provides some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes. They'll provide some additional information that will be particularly handy if you're not reading along. How are you, McKelly? I am tired, but I'm doing all right. You're back from a vacation, right? We got back into North Carolina um, yesterday midday, and I, I tried my best to stay up as late as I could to throw the jet lag off in the, uh, I was, I made it up the latest of my family. We were, we, we were, we were in Hawaii. We spent a week in Maui and that six time zones for those of you keeping score. Oof. So, uh, we left 8 PM Maui time and got in at noon the next day, East coast time. So I made it till 10. The, the next closest Molly made it till 9 p.m. And um, Stacy and Ethan both fell asleep at 7. But, uh, you know, it's because no one slept on the flights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Did, did, did the flight undo all the joy? I mean, like... You know, uh, especially on the, way out, on the way out there, I was concerned about that. But the minute we got to the resort we were staying at, well, not the minute. I'm still pretty tired. <laughs> I was feeling because it was like we got in, our flight got delayed out of Dallas. We flew uh, to Dallas and had a was supposed to be a two hour layover. It turned out to be a six and a half hour layover. Ish. So we didn't get to Maui until like seven or eight p.m., which would have been the wee hours of the morning East Coast time. So I was pretty. We were all pretty exhausted. But the next morning, when I woke up at three a.m. <laughs> because that's what my biological Stacy and I both woke up at like three twenty a.m. Oh god! <laughs> um, 
when the, we when we were walking around the resort, it was pitch dark out. But what were we supposed to do? <laughs> so, uh, but no, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a deterrent. It was. I'm not saying I'd go back next week, but I would go back. <laughs> okay. It was I, I've never been to Hawaii, time. but I've I've heard great things. I've heard it's wonderful. Yes, it really was. It really was. We did a lot of really cool things. The very first day, we went. Um, we got surf lessons. I, okay. My family went with my really good friend Chris's family and his his brother Matt, and um, we all, except for Stacy and Chris's wife Becky, all went and got surf lessons. And they're they're ranging from uh, you know Chris and Matt and I, you know, grown middle aged adults, down to uh, kids uh, around eleven year old. Okay. And I was by far the worst. Oh, by. Yeah. Far the worst. I was, we were there for two hours, two hours of like the lesson part took like 10 minutes. So it was like an hour and 50 minutes of (laughs) trying to stand stand up up on the board and surf. (laughs) I was the only one that never successfully did it. (laughs) I got close a couple times, but my center of gravity is just, it is not meant for things of that nature. I'm not good at roller skating or ice skating or anything like that so i'm not shocked but boy was i bad <laughs> stacy took many quite humorous videos to everyone else of me <laughs> just falling out like trying to get up and just falling off the board without even getting to my knees or anything i feel like so. i would be particularly terrible at that i have to say i i don't know how's your balance <laughs> not, well i can do the i can do the wakeboarding but i just but you see these people with the boats where they do basically surf behind the boat. Yeah, you seen this? yeah, I have. And, and with a little rope and then they let go of the rope and they can just surf indefinitely back there. I mean, that seems to me to be the place to learn. Yes, I would. Because you've got go, yeah. an ongoing infinite wave that just keeps going and going. Right. Like, you get good like that. I did get up one time. I got up and got my balance right as the wave petered out. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> right as we got to the surf and petered out. I was like, I did. Oh, man. This, it was curving over your head, right? This yes. Thing, yeah. I was in the tube. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We we had a lot of fun. We went uh, snorkeling. Saw some really cool things. Uh, Molokini Crater. And I saw a sea turtle in this ser- section called Turtle Town. And uh, Stacy and the kids and I went out on a an outrigger canoe. We went uh, out into the ocean. That was pretty cool. Saw turtles... The um, our guide the, who was in the back would we'd see a tur- sea turtle and he would steer our canoe so that the sea turtle would would go float between the outrigger part and the oh, canoe part where we sit and cool. it would just like float right by. It was really neat. So Sweet. did a lot of really cool stuff. But I'm back. I'm tired, but I'm ready to talk about Aria. So now, do, do, I, do you know that our company bought a Honolulu based company while you were gone? Seriously? Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? It is weird. You could have popped over and met them. Yeah. Got the trip not, paid for. I wasn't in Honolulu. I was in Maui, but still not uh, uh, not too far away. Hawaii is, Hawaii is just a black box to me. I mean, like people ask me which, <laughs> you know, Carson told me to ask you which island. And I was like, I asked him and he said the name of an island and it meant nothing to me, dear. We were in Wailea, Maui, which is a, the southern part of Maui. So it's oh, good. The quite, part, yes. not the northern yes. part, yeah. <laughs> it's the, it's the I mean? place to be. It's it's all the rage. <laughs> all the rage. You were, Because you went there, it would be, yeah. Do you know a weird thing that also happened while we were out there? It randomly came up. I can't even remember how it came up. About David Robinson. He's a, a former NBA great. He went to the Naval Academy and um, played center for Don't the, you have a photograph with him? I went, Stacey and Ethan. I, we, were at, we were in Annapolis. And he was there, photograph. and Stacy and Ethan took a picture of, yeah. uh, with him. And um, we j- it just came up one night at dinner. I can't even remember why it came up. Oh, we were, I think it started talking about how big Shaq was. Someone mentioned right, about how okay. large Shaq was. Right. And I mentioned when I took that picture of Stacy and Ethan that they looked like small children next to David yes. Robinson. The odd thing, when my friend Chris and his family, they, they flew, a, they, they live in a different city, so they flew a different route home. On their flight was David Robinson. Get out. Totally random coincidence that he wow, just came weird. up like the night before at dinner and he was on their flight. That's amazing. That, that is amazing. It's the craziest thing. So. The thing is, you, you got to wonder if that kind of thing is happening all the time. 
but it's only with NBA players that you get to notice them. You know? like, <laughs> right, because he's seven foot two or something. Yeah. You could you could talk about soccer players all day long, and they could be on the flight. You'd never right. know. But <laughs> <laughs> good point. That's a good point. And of course, you people like you and I would never know anyway because we're back in steerage, whereas my friend Chris and his family were up in first class. So good only point. they would ever actually see the celebrities. Good point. Good point. Um. So I'm having fun here with uh, my my nieces in town still. We're having yes. a good time. It's going well. Um, her presence reminded me of a story which I might have shared with you about my other niece, who isn't actually my niece. She is what my wife, the social worker, refers to as fictive kin. Oh, this is okay. A, co- a concept where you believe this, you act with this person as if they are kin, but they are not technically kin. Uh huh. So I have I have a fictive niece, and um. Once, and this, I don't even remember what the, what platform it was she was contacting me on. It was, you know, let's say Google Chat or something like that. But she accidentally started a three-way conversation with me, her, and another person called Simon. <laughs> Two Simons. <laughs> and we, I mean, I, I was like, that's kind of weird. But I sort of like started, hey, Julia, how are you doing? Kind of thing. And... She quickly became aware of what she'd done, and she clearly didn't want to talk to me. I was clearly not the <laughs> you object. You were the wrong of Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out, other Simon was some hunky kid she'd met on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, this is just red rag to a bull to me. I'm like in my element now. <laughs> like, oh, let's see, Julia. You know, so I'm, I'm cracking jokes all over the place. And, but the thing was, I was really enjoying myself and thinking I was being really funny. And then the kid, Simon, came up with the best joke of all. He said, <sighs> he, yeah, I know. I'm slightly annoyed by that. But he said, are you my conscience? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, you've won. I'll hey, leave well, you I'm, to it. I'm out of here. I'll leave you kids to your conversation. <laughs> oh, well. All right. We're at the 12 minute mark. Oh, goodness. Let's get down to business. How did we leave Arya Stark? Well, as we saw of Arya, having stolen a Riverlands map and a dagger from Lord Roos Bolton, she was escaping from Harrenhal with Gendry and Hot Pie, neither of whom were quite so keen on the plan. In order to escape, she was forced to murder a guard in cold blood. A high price, but Harrenhal under Roos Bolton and the Brave Companions was fast becoming untenable. Mm -hmm. Michele, why don't we give the summary of this one? All right. Before I do, I just remind people, if you just listen to the past 12 minutes of Simon and I going on and on and you don't want to do that, you could have always just used the chapter marker and skipped ahead to the character recap. But now it's too late since you've already listened to it. <laughs> hang, on, hang on, though, McKelly. <laughs> now that they know this, no one's ever going to listen to us again. <laughs> Straight over that part. Okay, so anyway, here we go with the summary. Rain falls as Arya, Hot Pie, and Gendry ride stolen horses north from Harrenhal. While wolves howl, Arya thinks about the thefts and murder that they've committed and how all of Harrenhal will rise up to find the escapees. She knows Roose Bolton won't hunt them himself, but she's afraid of his man Steel Shanks Walton or Vargo Hote and his bloody mummers. Their calling card is cutting off hands and feet, so that's incentive to keep going. At the first stream, Arya does the smart thing and leads the horses upstream, throwing off any hounds that might be used in pursuit. Hot Pie is as wary of Arya as he is terrified of the pursuit. Arya's okay with that. She herself feels pretty good. Riding through the forest, steel weapons, and the sound of wolves. It's a kind of her happy place. Yeah. The gents both have trouble with their mounts, as they're city slickers. <laughs> in a burned-out village, they see a dozen corpses hung in an apple tree. Hot Pie says a prayer to the mother. Arya recites her kill list. She pulls a wormy apple from the tree and eats it, including the extra protein. As dawn slowly rises, the lads finally ask Arya if she knows where they're going. North is the answer. She's headed to the Red Fork of the Trident, and from there upstream to River Run. Hot Pie is primarily impressed that she can read. They wonder why she feels they'll be safe in River Run, but she's still with the holding on who she is, at least from Hot Pie. Gendry's already in the know. Arya howls at the pack of wolves, and their leader howls back. 
She's worried that they're not moving fast enough, but there's no sign of pursuit. The boy's poor horsemanship is slowing them down, but Arya sees them as her pack now, so she plans to stick with them regardless. They come across a river, but Arya's not sure it is the Trident. It seems too narrow. Consulting the map isn't helpful. Some possible rivers run to the Trident, but others outflow into the God's Eye at Harrenhal. They cross it together, and as night draws in, Hot Pie's wish for a fire is roundly refused. Arya doesn't want to let them stop, but eventually she succumbs to the inevitable and falls asleep in the saddle. When she wakes with a start, Jenry agrees to take first watch. Hop High is already asleep, and Arya reassures herself that the Bloody Mummers must also need to rest. She drifts off to the usual roll call of her enemies. She vividly dreams of the Bloody Mummers, a Lyseni, an Axeman from Ib, a Dothraki named Ego, and a Dornishman, through the eyes of a wolf. The wolf is huge, and the four men and their horses stink of fear. As she watches, her pack tears the men apart. The Dothraki manages to kill two wolves, but Arya leaps forward to kill him. She exults in the carnage. So you can see why we we spent extra time chatting. There's, it, yeah, it's I not mean, the most impactful chapter, but no, it's, no, it's 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 progress for Arya, but it's you know not an awful lot of progress, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, which is one thing that Hot Pie points out when he realizes how far they've gone on the map. Right. He's just like he's like your fingers almost touching Harrenhal. We couldn't have only come this far. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, Hot Pie grew up in King's Landing, right? I mean, he never went out of King's Landing. He has no concept of the size of the continent. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he thought since they rode all day and night and hadn't stopped that uh, they should be almost to river. <laughs> the wall should be hoving into view. <laughs> so a thread throughout this chapter is the company, accompaniment of wolves. You know, pretty much all the time, they just sort of like it gets thrown in just repeatedly that they can hear wolves howling in the distance. So... There's definitely a feeling here that this is Nymeria and her pack looking out for Arya, perhaps. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure yeah. we'll ever get that confirmed, but that definitely feels like it's... Who... Right, and they don't just hear the pack, they actually see, see them multiple wolves. Times. So at one point, Arya thought she saw Bolton men crossing a stream, and it turned out to just be a wolf pack, and she howled at the pack, and the largest wolf of that pack howled back, and you know, like you just said, could that largest wolf possibly have been Nymeria? Yeah. Or it, could, it, could Nymeria's pack be staying close to keep an eye on Arya and the boys? Yeah, that was my feeling is she never actually laid eyes on Nymeria. That Nymeria's pack is sort of dispersed. The, the largest wolf she saw there was just the largest wolf of that sort of sub pack. Yeah, but, that's very, yeah, that. Most likely I, that's the case. Yeah, because cause I feel like if, if she ever saw Nymeria, they would come together. They would, you know, Nymeria would trot up to her. Oh, but maybe not. Maybe. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about if that was Nymeria and Arya howled at her, would Nymeria be able to pick up on Arya's voice? The sound yeah. of Arya's voice. Well, you feel like they're still connected because you feel like Nymeria is tracking them and keeping them safe, you know? Right, and, and we also get this dream, which we'll talk about later. If if this dream is a, a brand type warging, or, or John at this point type warging dream, then there is definitely a spiritual connection between the two of them. So, yeah. Yeah. But uh, just simply just seeing the house sigil, her house, the dire wolf, her, uh, seeing the wolves, you know, especially during all this hardship and general time of confusion that she's got going on in her life right now, you know, it, it possibly could be a boost to her strength to give her the strength she needs to keep going on and continue to be the leader that she's been. And subconsciously, it probably both reminds her and us that she's a Stark of Winterfell, regardless of what name she's been going by or what role she's been playing, whether it's Ari or Nan or Weasel. Yeah, yeah. I, thinking about the whole... Arya Nymeria thing. Um, if you've ever read The Golden Compass by Philip Pullman, one of the things that, um, one of the motifs of that book is that children are born with what's called a demon, and the demon is their spirit animal. And pre puberty, the, 
the spirit animal can change form. It can change from a mouse to a dog to a cat uh-huh. to a lion, you know, to all kinds of things. And at puberty, it sort of f- settles down into a single form and stays with the person for the rest of their life. But this thing is kind of like a just that they're sp- the person's spirit and it's sort of connected to them and they can never be too far apart from it. And it's just co- a constant companion for them. And right. this kind of reminds me of this. And one of the one of the not to spoil that book for anyone, but one of the things that um, the authorities try to do is try to sever the bond between children and the demon just to see what will happen kind of thing. So sort of like okay. monstrous experiments. To a certain extent, I feel like this is kind of what's happened to to Arya and Nymeria here, that the, the two have been sundered and they maybe can never quite come back together again because right. the, they've been parted and will always be apart. Yeah, yeah, that's... A- very interesting uh, way to think about it. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> but we also get more description here as they're traveling through the, the Riverlands of just what we're, what's going on. And there's one line where the, the description says that this was the day without a dawn. And I thought not even the sun comes out in the Riverlands these days. And uh, it kind of felt like, like a, that line, a day without a dawn, felt like a visual metaphor for life in the Riverlands right now. It's pretty much endless hardship, and then you die. Either you you didn't make it, you 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 died early on, you fled, or if you're still in the Riverlands, you're basically just trying to eke out a survival as best you can. Here, we've seen yeah. from Jamie's perspective. You know, he saw a few people still living in the Riverlands and, and they were just um, trying to survive as best they possibly could under the circumstances. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. And because the more prosaic reading of this is that it was just a bit cloudy. But... <laughs> it could be that too. <laughs> you always go for the poetic. I know, I, know, I do. I have a tendency to do so. But it, it basically it picks up right where Jamie left us as far as the description in the Riverlands. The, the the same like paragraph or so that I was referring to with the day without a dawn started with that they passed through burned villages and threaded their way carefully between shells of blackened hovels, past bones of a dozen dead men hanging from uh, rows of apple trees or a yeah. row of apple trees, something like that. Yeah, and, and I think it comes to something, um, it points to where Arya's reached. I mean, she's still just a little girl, yeah. but she reaches up and eats an apple out of that tree, you know. Mm. Um, <laughs> you are you are inured to the horrors when you can just eat the apple from amongst the dead. Yes, absolutely. You're, you're, you're completely hardened at yeah. that point from seeing such atrocities, I guess. But, but I hope it's human nature, not just me. To find Arya eating the worm-filled apple to be slight, the most disgusting part of that. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> it sh- I should care more about the 12 dead men hanging from the tree, but <laughs> my stomach turned at the apple with the worms in it. Yeah, that was, that'd was that be pretty gross. The, that extra protein, I'm sure, uh, helped nourish her. Because, I did wonder uh, about that, though, because they're, they're not actually short of food yet, so it's pretty, it's pretty ballsy of her to do that. Yeah. You know? <sighs> Yeah. Earlier, you remember, I mean, before they got to Harren Hall, they were really eking out an existence, and I would have totally understood it there. But here, she's actually fed. So Right. Yeah. So far, yeah, they were living off of um, acorn paste, I think it was, or right. something like that. Right. <laughs> but, you know, you, you'll have to see how well three young people can ration their food, because food supply might become an issue uh, when these meager supplies run out and then they will be back to eating wormy apples and uh, yeah. acorn paste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not criticizing her. Eat what you can while you can on a journey like this. You know, you're likely to run out of food. And at least if you've eaten that now, it'll be in your reserves for the future, you know. Right. Fatten yourself yes. up. <laughs> yeah, well, we see... Arya just completely, much like Nymeria is the leader of this large wolf pack here in the Riverlands, Arya is the clear leader of this tiny little pack of her gendry and hot pie. And uh, she feels responsible for them. And, you know, she, yeah. she lied to get them to come with her. She told them, told gendry that 
Vargo Holt's plan was to cut. It was cut off, I think, the left foot of all of the servants, one of the feet of all the servants of um, Harrenhal. So uh, that was one of the one of the ways she managed to convince Gendry to round up Hot Pie and go. So she definitely has some responsibility in keeping them safe here because she totally made that up to uh, <laughs> get them to follow her. <laughs> and it, it makes you wonder, should she have should she have done that? Should she have brought them? She could have escaped on her own. She got the horse by herself. She killed the guard to get out. So Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. I mean, you'd hate to see a 11-year-old girl wandering the forests by herself. Yes, but exactly. on the flip side, she's certainly exposing these two to danger. Yeah, and she realizes how much faster she could have gone by herself because right. they're not they're not skilled riders. And uh, and I do I get the desire not to make this journey alone, especially for a ten year old. But you know, would it have been best for both parties if the boys had stay behind had stayed behind? Yeah, I, I I gotta say I think Hot Pie with his cooking skills was going to make a a living there. I think Gendry was still vulnerable because Gendry is who he is, and so well, he'll always be of point. interest to the Lannisters. You know, that's a good point. If they ever discovered who he was, that that could right. be problematic for him. Of course, he have to discover who he is first. <laughs> it might never. It- they might never find him, but he is a blacksmith who looks like Robert Baratheon, and that always, eventually, someone will notice. Who knows? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, that's possible. But you know, so you were mentioning about the, the dead men in the trees, and it is very similar to what Jamie and Brienne and Cleos came across when they saw. I think it was around a dozen or so, half a dozen women hung from a tree. Um, in the Jamie chapter, uh, what was that, two chapters ago? So, yeah. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. It, it does seem like it's the predominant crop of the Riverlands at the moment. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and winter is Gall- coming. Would that be so. considered gallows humor? <laughs> hey, I see you did that. Well done. Oh. But speaking of Jamie and his part, his uh, party of uh, two, two extras, I guess, party of three total. Um, if the kids do make it to the Red Fork and they travel uh, west like they plan to, they could very well pass right by Jamie, Brienne, yeah. and Cleos. Yep. Uh, they they might even hit. It might even be a coming together of these people. Right. Which, which would then be then if, an interesting question for Brienne. If she, if Brienne were to meet her and know who yes. she was, what does Brienne do at that point? Exactly. Because she's tasked with bringing Jamie to King's Landing and retrieving the girls. Right. But if she comes across one along the way, does mm-hmm. she do a U-turn or does she mm-hmm. keep going with Jamie? You, you know what? She, in, in that, just sort of like theorizing that, what she should do is cut Jamie loose. Say, where are you going to go? King's Landing? <laughs> That's where I want go. you to go. I'm taking this kid back home. You know? Yeah. She wouldn't get Sansa, but, I mean, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. But but she could ask Jamie to fulfill the other half of the bargain. She could say to Jamie, and when you get there, fulfill your half of the bargain. You 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 swore to it. Well, but that's true. There's about the same it. likelihood of Jamie coming through with his half, whether Brienne is there or not. Right. Right, exactly. It's not like Brienne can strong arm the whole of King's Landing into doing what she wants. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she did get the map from Bruce Bolton, but none of them have a lot of experience in reading maps, and they're she's smart to focus on the rivers. But when you do hit a stream, is it a river or is it a stream or is it on the map or is it not on the map? Uh, I sympathise with their issues of trying to understand that. It just would not be easy. 
Oh goodness. Oh no, definitely would not. And you can you can see the challenges involved in navigating this terrain just from the description that we get. You know, just this chapter, the they're basically using this vague map, the sun and moss, where moss is growing on the trees is their only guide. And it kinda I had a thought of like you could see like a Blair Witch project situation <laughs> where they're just riding in circles just out of view of Heron Hall. <laughs> right. Because it would be really hard to ride in a straight line through this rough topography with the hills and the thick forest. It, it'd be really hard to do. And, you know, so I looked up because I had always thought that it was the... So let me back up for a second. Aria says, well, let me back up even further than that. G- Gendry asks, where are we going? And she says, north. And he says, how do you know which direction is north? The sun, you know, we can't see the sun because it was the day without a dawn. And she says, you see the moss on these trees, that's south. So we're going in the opposite direction. But I had always thought that moss grew on the northern side of things. So I looked it Thank up. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> that's what did you I look thought. Up, did you look it up as well? I, just as you start... You, you know you. You take a long time to get to a point, so I've looked it up. And, oh, you're blathering. <laughs> Not the first time I've been accused of that by you. <laughs> Go ahead and describe why what the difference is here. Oh, I don't know because I haven't looked oh, at what. Okay, all I've so looked up, what what I found when I looked the it Google up. Google machine confirms my belief. Moss grows <laughs> on the north side of trees. Yes, it does in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, it's the south side. I would have ex- I would have expected that they are in the northern hemisphere of this planet. Clearly, because north is it's where the colder. cold is. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I thought that uh, I, I thought that odd. Oh, so you you don't have any explanation? This is just like no. He I don't have make, an explanation. He decided to make. She thought it was weird. on the. Maybe she's misunderstanding. Oh, yeah. That's my Oh, I see what you mean. She's, she's headed south this whole time. She'll be in King's Landing before Jamie. <laughs> She'll get there before Jamie. <laughs> Brienne can bring both the girls home. <laughs> I think eventually the clouds will lift and they'll be able to look at the sun and go, you know what? <laughs> that sun is directly in front of us when it should be directly behind us. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I just thought when I read it, I thought, I always thought it was on the northern side. And for I us in the northern too. hemisphere, oh. according to my very basic internet research, it is... North in the northern hemisphere and south in the southern hemisphere. So, but is there any way she could be in the southern hemisphere? Could it get, you know, because you'd be heading toward the equator if you were going north, which would be getting warmer. So, yeah. yeah no, I don't know. there's not. They're in the northern hemisphere. It's absolutely clear. <laughs> well, maybe we should uh, re rack this and put it in pedantry. Well, I think maybe. <laughs> I don't know. You said, now you said, I always was like, I must have not known this. I mean, me I'll too. Admit, my outdoorsiness is questionable. You know? Mine but too. <laughs> I, I did honestly believe that that was a mistake. And now I, I feel like it's been verified. Well, maybe there are some outdoorsy people who are listening and maybe there's a rational explanation yeah. that they could provide us. So Arya, of course, is incredibly tough and strong and resilient and badass. But, and, but, and that, all of that masks the fact that she's 10 years old, you know? Right. You, don't ex- you know, she howls at wolves and... You know, basically converses with them, but she's ten years old, and she's you know, she is a kid. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't see Ned doing that if he saw a pack of wolves. (laughs) It's his sigil too. He wouldn't do the fun part of that. (laughs) He he'd send the wolf a tersely written missive. Yeah, she she see you can see some vulnerability here in, in this. You know, in this chapter, you see some vulnerability. She she's trying her best to navigate and lead and stay strong and confident, but we get her internal thoughts where she definitely is struggling uh, with self-doubt in her decision-making here. Uh, so, you know, we, we see the fact that she's not quite as um, strong as she is pretending to be for the rest of her pack. Yeah. The, the other two need some cajoling because they're obviously, they're not as willing to be here as she was, and uh, neither of them knows how to ride a horse very well. But Gendry is pretty stoic about it, but Hot Pie most certainly is not. Um, right. 
complains at every opportunity. Um, <laughs> and of course, she's still unwilling to reveal to him her true identity. And I got to say, this whole the whole experience in in Harrenhal has sort of justified that. There's been several times where she's been tempted to reveal, and she's never done it to anyone. The only person who sussed it is Gendry, and she did reveal to him, but she's never revealed to anybody else. You know, she, uh, when Roose Bolton came to Harrenhal, she absolutely could have said, "Hey, I'm Arya Stark." Right. Um, but the way Harrenhal was, and the dangers of the bloody mummers and what have you, makes are going to make her think. I'm never telling anyone. The next person I tell I'm Arya Stark to is my mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of time thinking about that during this chapter. And I thought the best time to do it would have been right away to tell Roos. Because at that point, the Lannisters were really on the ropes. Rob was clearly winning this war. And it would have been the, the best time. This... She's not just the son of some northern lord. I mean, daughter. She's not just the daughter of some northern lord. She is the sister of the king. So, yeah. if if she had told them right, told as many people of the upper lords as she could have right away, I think that would have been the best time to do it. Yeah, but she doesn't she... know her mom is at River Run, though. Right, that's true. It might have changed the the decision if she had known not just her brother, but also her mom was at River Run. Yeah. Um, but she, just a reminder, she learned that Rob was at River Run, and through the soldiers that were uh, were coming and going at Heron Hall, they were telling outlandish stories like Rob was a warg, which actually very well might be, and um, that he'd be the weird one if he wasn't at this point. <laughs> right, <laughs> and uh, that he had giants and stuff like that. But that's how she learned he was at River Run. She has not learned yet that Cat's there because they weren't talking about cat being at river on these right, soldiers right, right. we'll be right back this episode is sponsored by audible to get a free audiobook or two if you're an amazon prime member go to our exclusive url audibletrial.com slash ghosts you can find the link in our show notes yeah she does wonder again what gendry's secret might be she she is fairly convinced that even he doesn't know what it is so that makes it harder to sleuth it out because you can't question <laughs> right <him. laughs> yeah and of course we know gendry's secret is that he's king robert's bastard she started she knew something was up back at that ivy covered inn when the gold cloaks showed up looking for him at the queen's direction she thought they were looking for her turned out they were looking for gendry so she knows he's got some tie to the queen right she right. just but neither of but them know what it is that leaves a huge vista of possible reasons you know she may yeah. he may have shoddily given her a, a horseshoe for her horse and it didn't work you know <laughs> now gendry should know more because no less than john aaron stans baratheon and ned stark have showed up showed up at his workplace wanting to talk to him he he might be able to pick up on something there but did they ever say anything that wasn't... I, I Actually, my recollection is that Ned did say something like, wow, he looks like him, or something like that. In, but whether he, he said it I can't remember him, if he said it or thought it. Uh, stupid books. They should just... But he did ask what his mother looked like. He did ask him about his right. mother. So he might be able to parse out, why are you asking me about my parents? Maybe. They should, Still. Just make, a t- they should make a TV show of this, and then we wouldn't have to wonder if it was spoken or thought. You know? <laughs> yeah, good idea. <laughs> If they stick to the uh, stick to the story, <laughs> so Arya is spurred by fear that is probably unfounded. I mean, sure, Bolton would be mad that a couple of servants had escaped, but and that they murdered someone and that they stole from him. But he has bigger fish to fry. I mean, you know. Uh, yes, absolutely. Of course, all of that would change very dramatically if her identity was known. <laughs> then he'd be very interested to capture her at that point. Yes. Yeah, I, I was. I thought about that as well, and I was thinking, honestly, the biggest infraction is probably stealing the horses over even killing that guard, because those horses might be, uh, you know, important for their cause more so than than one northern guard. But uh, yeah, as you were saying, 
Bruce Bolton has a lot of other issues. And so I, it's been a while since we uh, talked about Roos, and there's a lot of things going on. So I just wanted to remind you guys just what some of the things that Roos is dealing with. The Lannisters, having won in King's Landing, have the Freys all bent out of shape, and they think that their cause is lost, so they want Rob to sue for peace. He's also got concerns that the Lannisters might move north and besiege Harrenhal, although he says he said he was not about to let that happen. He has sent Robert Glover and Helmand Tallhart to Duskendale, and the Freys at the end of Arya 10 were up in arms over some dishonor that happened either to their family or from their family. It was not quite, or, you know, something within their family or something that happened to their family. It wasn't quite clear in the chapter. And he's also sent Vargo Hote and the Bloody Mummers out to hunt for Lannister supporters in the Riverlands. So he's got a lot of a lot of uh, issues to think about. Yeah, that that's interesting you mentioned that dishonor to the phrase, because obviously having read ahead, I do know what that dishonor is what they're referring right. to. It's surprising to me that it didn't come up in the last chapter, in fact. Oh, the cat chapter. The cat chapter. Because cat received a letter from the person who, well, avoiding spoilers. <laughs> you, you see what I mean, though? It's surprising yes. it didn't get covered by that. Word had reached Aaron Hall of it. Yes, that's a good point. Yes. It's a good point. Unless it was after the fact, because Cat 1 of this book backs up in time to the King's Landing. Uh, good point. The good battle point. Uh, on the Wow, that battle whole the timeline thing is a get-out-of-jail-free card, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so she thinks either that uh, Still Shanks Walton or Vogue, Vargo Hote and his brave companions, or Bloody Mummers, as they're also known, are the two likely... Uh, people to uh, groups to be sent out to find her. Now, Steel Shanks, we met in that last Aria chapter, Aria 10 of A Clash of Kings. He was involved in, uh, he, w- he was playing headsman in Harrenhal and, and mounting a lot of those heads on the uh, the wall there when uh, Kat was, when Aria was looking at them in the beginning of the chapter. Yeah. But, you know, between the two, between Steel Shanks, Walton, and Vargo Hote, I think it would be better for Arya if it was Steel Shanks that was sent because he's a Northman. And so he's more likely to respond well to Arya's revelation that she is King Rob's sister than the unstable Vargo Hote, who is not even from Westeros at all. Yep, that's true. That's true. I I do think, of course, that she's completely overblowing her importance. I mean, right. okay. Ari's importance, not Arya's importance. Her importance is actual, <laughs> actually real, but, but her persona is not very important at all. And so they won't be chasing her. I would think roughly at a maximum they would send maybe four of the Brave Companions to follow her. Four? <laughs> wow, that's a very specific number. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that seems more likely than the chief headsman and all the Brave Companions chasing after her. Right. <laughs> but it's a good so point. she walks very much like Bran did, but perhaps even more so because I mean Bran walks there's 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 basically a pack of two, uh, between Summer and Shaggy Dog, there's a pack of two, but Nymeria which just an assumption still that it's Nymeria, has amassed a master significant and well organized pack who can seriously lend her a hand here. I mean and if the warg dream is to be believed, does so. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. And we saw from the John and Bran warging chapters that nearly all instances uh, that we've been given in, insight into anyway, the wolf dreams were actually real life warging situations, not just dreams. Yeah. Like when right. Summer met Jojen and Bran uses Summer's eyes to see Winterfell when they're in the crypts and John seeing the wildling army and the eagle. Yeah. And, um, and they all fit the same form point of view that Arya is having here with Nymeria, where she was more like in the mind of oh, Nymeria, Nymeria. Yeah. be actually a wolf, not Nyme- not Arya in the mind. She couldn't understand the human speak, yeah. but yeah. she yeah. was, you know, it all fit that same format. Yeah. So the brave companions that were sent formed an interesting crew. There was a Lysini, an Ibanese, a Dothraki, and a Dornishman, which is actually one of the best Openings to a Westerosi joke ever. (laughs) (laughs) 
but a minor critique, none of them have a lifetime of experience of tracking quarry in moist, rivery farmlands of central Westeros. Three of them are from Essos, and one of them is from the Deserts of Dawn. So um, actually, they're not perfect choices for this. You just think that the Brave Companions would have at least one person with the right kind of uh, uh, weather slash terrain uh, knowledge to send. Right, yeah, yeah. Or, or se- you know, send someone else to lead that group, someone right. who is a little more... Exactly. Uh, knows the local geography better one question i have for you is so we're pretty confident that she had a warg dream not just a dream right so the right. events of the dream happened but aria doesn't know that right aria might wake up the next morning and go oh, i wish that happened <laughs> yes yes is I know she going, going to act this. now as if the pursuit has been decimated behind her or is she going to keep running until she falls asleep in the saddle you know yeah because you we would have you wouldn't think that Roose Bolton would behave like G.R. Mormont and just keep throwing more troops at what <laughs> happened to the missing force. You, you we're going to send people to find out. <laughs> Eventually, he's going to ride out in force. Oh, <laughs> uh, yo, yeah, that's a very good point. She likely would not know. Oh, that was a real life. Uh, and, and we don't know for a fact, but it just fits with how yeah, the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, things we've seen as far as these work dreams go but of course the other thing that might make it seem unreal to her is that there were only four of them she thinks the whole of harrenhal is on their tail (laughs) so she might think well that's a nice dream i wish that would happen to everybody who's chasing me but yeah so i'm worried that she's still gonna be bruce did send out the great ranging right exactly (laughs) i don't we to my memory and I, i really didn't look into this ahead of time i don't recall a previous wolf dream from Arya. Nor do I. So I wonder if this might have something to do with Nymeria's proximity to her. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. I think so. And also, well, well, no, it's hardly the danger to Arya because she's been in this much danger since, you know, since Game of Thrones. She's been in this much danger. Yeah, and she's heard wolves howling and she's seen wolves while they while she was riding with Yorin. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll put it down to proximity, like you said. So, do you have some background for us? I do, and let me tell you, this is possibly the hardest chapter I've ever had to come up with a background for. It might be because I was also on vacation (laughs) that I didn't spend a lot of time working on it, thinking about it, but I actually did. I I spent a lot of mornings thinking about what I could possibly do background on for this chapter. I did feel a responsibility to write the background for you because I knew you were on vacation, but I took one look at the chapter and was like, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. (laughs) <laughs> He's on his own here. <laughs> I need him. Yeah, in the notes you had, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what I wrote? <laughs> yeah. And I responded with, neither do I. <laughs> but I, I came up with something. So what I decided to focus on was just the Riverlands. Let's talk about the more about the history of the Riverlands. So one of the ancient noble houses of the Riverlands was House Fisher who were kings of the area during the time of the first men. Some historical records suggest that House Fisher was the oldest dynasty of first men river kings, while other works suggest that they were the second or third, but regardless, they were one of the first to rule this region of Westeros. The, this House Fisher is not to be confused with the northern house of the same name, who ruled the stony shore after the long night. We talked about them in the Theon chapter when they were at the Stony Shore. Yep. It is, it's unknown if the two houses share any relation. Uh, House Fisher's seat was Misty Isle, and the location of Misty Isle in the Riverlands has yet to be divulged. So I, I tried to figure out where B- Misty Isle was, but literally when I, my research on Misty Isle led me to it hasn't been provided yet. Oh, so okay. don't know where it is. It's believed that their sigil was a crowned catfish, spotted gray on a blue background. And and no one knows for sure what brought their rule to an end. However, some suggest that they were possibly destroyed in wars with the Storm Kings or the Iron Men. Hmm. The only named fisher I could find was Sir Lyman Fisher, uh, the Knight of Old Stones. After the Storm King Arlen III Durandon conquered the Riverlands, various pretenders unsuccessfully claimed to be River Kings. He was one such pretender. 
but his exact connection to the ancient fishers is not confirmed. So, well, thanks for coming up with something. <laughs> I could have just said, I got nothing. <laughs> so this is the best I can do. You, you really got to fish for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Comparison with the television show. Pretty much none of this happens. Uh, she escapes Harren Hall with Gendry and Hot Pie without murdering anyone because she gets the help of Jack and Hagar. That's his final favour to her. That's his third wish, is to help her escape. Um, okay. He does murder some people to help her get out. It's, uh, <laughs> no, the murder is not directly by the child, but uh, on her behest. Right. Uh, Jack and then leaves her, so she and the two boys walk north. The only TV scene of that part of this journey that I saw was the three of them talking to and being invited to join the campfire of a group of men. I don't know if it would be spoiler to say who they are, as I don't remember where the book is headed, so I won't mention who they were, but that's the only, the yeah. only scene with the three of them walking north. Okay. Uh, Penetry Corner, um, unless Arya does not know how to read Moss, um, <laughs> George Martin doesn't know how to read Moss. <laughs> See previous conversation. Exactly. Now, there might be a logical explanation that I'm yeah. no outdoorsman, you know? I, I cut the grass, I take hikes, <laughs> But never to the point where I'm like backcountry having to use moss to guide my way. So, <laughs> News and notes. Speaking of Penetry Corner. Oh, yes. <laughs> so we, we got our first one-star review on Apple Podcasts in the US. The person did, I think, make a fair comment. Um, they said that character decisions aren't pedantry. But, I mean, that's absolutely correct. Can't... can't debate this point. But I think usually we do say, this isn't really pedantry because it's just a character decision. I think we say that more often than not. Yes. However, some character decisions are so obtuse that I feel that they are pedantry because it's like that character would not make that decision. And so right. it's a pedantry to the whole story that the character made that decision. So, eh. But hey. Yeah. We try. We can't we, please everyone, McKelly. I, I knew when we started a public podcast for the masses that eventually we would receive uh, some <laughs> such criticism and you handle such things better than i do one oh, of the yeah. very i've said this on the show before i think one of the the very first things that our friend rich told me about you as we were walking to the office that you and i shared is you're gonna love simon nothing rattles him everything is like water off a duck's back oh yeah so yeah, that's oh. not true, but I mean, it is for one-star reviews from people I don't know. I'm like, oh, whatever. On to brighter things. Yes, on, on to brighter things. Well, last episode, we told you that uh, the Hollywood Reporter had reported that HBO was working on a Game of Thrones sequel that would focus on a character from the Game of Thrones TV show. Well, since then, Martin has confirmed a few things. The working title is the character's last name. Now, remember, we are not saying who this character is because we are a spoiler-free show, and this show, this uh, sequel is a spinoff of whoever made it to the end of the show. Uh, it's been in the works. It turns out it's been in the works as long as the other three spinoffs, the 10,000 Ships, the Sne Sea Snake, and the Duncan Egg show. But for some reason, no leaks on this show occurred until now. He also confirmed, Martin that is, confirmed that the driving force behind the show's creation was the actor who played the character on A Game of Thrones. Okay, so it's a human. It's not it's one a of the human. dragons. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Having pulled together, the, this actor pulled together much of the production staff, including the showrunner and the writers. And this new team has met with Martin and his band of writers and consultants to nail down details of the show. So he is involved then. He is involved. Yes, yes. Yeah. Of course, it's it's all. Well, who knows how how it will play out compared to a Song of Ice and Fire? Because it's you know the after Game of Song Thrones of has already ended, and we are not at the end of a Song of Ice and Fire. So we hope. Of course. That being said, we don't know if the end of the TV show is going to correspond to the end of the books. I mean, the books exactly. might actually continue on to follow this character for longer than right. the TV show. So. Good maybe point. this is all in plan for George Martin. Yes. Or maybe it is now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said, all right, eight books it is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's conclude. So Arya is definitely the happiest she's been in a while. And uh, 
the whole warg dream about munching on some bloody mummers has got to feel good after months of uh, restricted freedom, if any. Yes. She might think that's what the dream was. It was just about getting retribution yeah. to, the, to the people that she really wanted so badly to get re- retribution on. But yeah, yeah it's, and it's clear that she's the leader of this little group of theirs. Uh, but like we were saying earlier, food, navigation, roving bands of ne'er-do-wells because, you know, the Riverlands probably isn't completely, even, even if those four bloody mummers are gone, there's probably other unsavory oh, yeah. characters in this yeah. area. So they're all still going to be a concern. And, and you know, speaking of all that, I, I kind of liked Martin putting a realistic obstacle like this in front of them, not just gloss over those realities the the reality of the daily life of trying to trudge through such a region, especially at as three teens at best, Arya is only ten, yeah. and uh, with very vague instructions on how to get where they're trying to go. Yeah, I mean, I think her prospects for escape were never quite as grim as she feared they were, because nobody knows her identity. She's not that big of a deal. Uh, but I do think that without the wolves, the four cell swords probably would have caught her. Because, I mean, like I said, even though they weren't natives to that region, they probably had enough tracking skills to track three horses through right. the woods. So, um, yes. Uh, Nymeria's done her a solid there. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it seems like Arya can warg just like Bran and John. speaking of Nymeria. Yeah. Yeah. So... What we can take from that right now is that all three Stark POVs with living wolves seem to have the power to warg. So we have to assume, based on that, that Rob and Rickon might as well, which yeah. would be very dangerous. Yeah. But Rickon and Shaggy are warging. Um, you did just legitimize John, by the way. Oh, I did. That's right. right. That's fine. If you want to do that, <laughs> he'd probably be happy to hear that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I called him a Stark. You, you, you know who would have objected? Catelyn Stark would be like, "Wait a minute." <laughs> um, so the chances of them being caught now seem pretty remote. I mean, they, they should have relatively plain sailing through the Riverlands, providing that they read that map accurately. You know, and if right, if they do, if they get it right, then like you said, there is a definite chance that they're going to intercept with Jamie and Brienne, which could make for an interesting. It's, it's one of the beauties of the of the book, and, and to a certain extent, the TV show as well. Is you've got all of these characters doing their story. But they're often in sort of geographic isolation from one another. And whenever two of them intersect, it's always a fascinating moment. It's like, oh, it is. you know, yeah. these two people have yeah. come together. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, now we don't know the, the timelines. Like I said, you know, the the chapters at the beginning of this book are earlier than the chapters at the end of A Clash of Kings. But we So we know that, but we don't know how these chapters now at the beginning of A Storm of Swords what their chronological makeup right, is. Right, yeah. We just know it's vague. Yeah. Yes, it's vague. <laughs> but Nymeria and her pack make a really useful Secret Service detail. I mean, that's... They sure do. <laughs> yes, that's one way to get through a dangerous... Exactly. She doesn't need these boys. She's got an entire wolf pack yeah. to help her out. Yeah, now, of course, it's unsure... We're unsure if the Brave Companions were actually killed... In Arya's dream, in real life killed. But all of our previous evidence points to it having been real. All our previous wolf yeah. dreams seem to, for the most part, have been real situations. So, yeah, we're off to King's Landing next. We got a Tyrion chapter. It's, oh, a, it's Tyrion. a longish Exciting. one too. Oh, cool! All right. So, um, I I always remember seeing the sticker on like a a, a vehicle, like a service vehicle of some sort, and it said. If you like us, tell your friends. If you don't like us, tell us. So, um, yes. <laughs> go and leave great us advice. A, yeah, go out and leave us a positive review. Help spread the word. Uh, if you want to discuss the show, uh, please reach out via email. Our email address is ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com. We will take under advisement. I already have. I mean, I'm already thinking I will not put a character decision in pedantry without very careful consideration. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, you, like you said, the point is valid. You can follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harrenhal. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. 
And you can help us out by um, buying merchandise from us at uh, ghostsofharrenhall.threadless.com. Or you could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold from buymeacoffee.com slash ghostsharrenhall. If uh, you could cu- also uh, become sustainers at the Lord Paramount or Knight of the Realm level. And for all of that, we greatly thank you. And but while McKelly's not on vacation, you, there are some significant benefits to being <laughs> 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 members of the <laughs> Lord Paramount or Knight of the Realm <laughs> sustainers. I do apologize, guys. I, uh, McKelly should not leave me in charge. He knows better. That's his last vacation. I I had a hunch because our email address is also on that distribution list. And when I didn't see it come in, I thought, hmm, they're six hours ahead of me. <laughs> I feel like I should have gotten this a while ago. <laughs> so that's why I sent you the email. How'd it go with that? <laughs> oh, goodness. That's okay. I blame Things you. Like that you should never have trusted me. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.